I guess uh, let's get started. Um, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Tang Fei Mu, um, engineer manager for the image container team at LinkedIn. Um, my colleague Abin Shahab, um, staff engineer at LinkedIn. Today we are going to talk about LinkedIn's journey of adopting Kubernetes for unified cluster management platform. As you can see from this picture, um, our journey is a, a Star Wars story. Assuming many of you have watched Star Wars. Star Wars. Um, here's the agenda in the episode view. We will start with introducing existing LinkedIn cluster management platform, how it encountered new challenges, thus we evaluated Kubernetes as our new hope. Um, then how we quickly started and approved value by supporting different kind of machine, machine learning related workloads um, on Kubernetes. And then eventually we're extending Kubernetes and uh, unifying our platform. So LinkedIn is the world, world's largest professional network with more than half a billion professionals in more than 200 countries and territories worldwide. Our mission is to connect the world's professionals to make them more productive, productive and successful. So both of us work in a team called LPS, LinkedIn Platform as Service. Our mission is to provide a compute platform for LinkedIn engineers to make them more productive and make efficient use of our, our hardware resources. So we have four pillars, enable innovation by providing the right building blocks and abstractions, increase developer and operations productivity, and increase hardware utilization. This is our scale. Uh, we manage thousands of services. Um, every day we have hundreds of thousands of builds. Uh, we have tens of thousands of deployments daily. We manage hundreds of thousands of hosts in, man in multiple data centers with millions of containers. So this is our existing cluster management platform, a simplified layered view. On the very bottom, we have in-ops, uh, which manages hardware assets and their life cycle. Then we have Rain, is resource allocation in LinkedIn, and Lead is for LinkedIn deployment control play. So on top of it, we have the pass layer. Race is for auto scaling and auto remediation. Orca is for short-lived job orchestration. Nuange is for storage service self uh, self storage self service provisioner. On the topmost we have Mistral. The idea is we are moving to this intent based service blueprint. In this architectural diagram, you can see we have multiple data centers each data center has multiple clusters. We call it a fabric. The fabric has its own control plane. We have one main artifactory cluster and another for disaster recovery purpose on in another data center. All the fabrics have their own artifactory proxies to scale out the read, read traffic. Let's go through a typical manual deployment workflow. Developer first comes to Ray to allocate or change resources for their services. They normally create a resource slice or profile, then it, they add instances or remove instances from it. After resource allocation, they can trigger deployment through our deployment control plane, lead, which will check our back against state vault, check their deployment policies and trigger config compilation and publish process, then generates and sends the deployment plan to physical host. After the deployment plan gets to the host, the host launcher will download the artifact image and configs, then start the application in the locker container, which is our abstraction layer over RunC. During the container start process, we decrypt secrets in the config, opens necessary firewall ports, and download the TLS certificate for the service so that 
service-to-service -service communication is HTTPS based. Other than the low running service job, we also have batch jobs orchestrated through Orca. Orca was started as our internal Jenkins replacement. Basically, it creates a tree of short running jobs with priorities and then utilize spare capacity in our common pool. When there is no available resources in the common pool, the jobs will remain in the queue. So Orca presented these challenges in terms of capability to support growing batch workloads. And then another challenge is how do we model the emerging, for example, AI workloads in our existing platform. Last but not least, having this portable stack across on-prem and Azure is critical to us nowadays. <clears throat> we uh, felt Kubernetes and other modern schedulers uh, gave us a new hope uh, to uh, deal with these challenges. Oops, backwards. Um, <clears throat> we set up the experiment. We set up a 60-node Kubernetes cluster and ran as many Orca post-commit jobs uh, there as possible. Post-commit jobs are jobs that run when a LinkedIn engineer submits code uh, or merges code or creates a pull request. And <clears throat> we found out that Kubernetes performed admirably compared to our own stack. Um, in measures such as how long does it take to take a job from uh, queued to running, Kubernetes performed really well. Poli we, perf we performed several other more tests, and holistically, we realized that Kubernetes and other modern schedulers can provide a generational boost to the productivity, um, operability, and utilization of our application fleet beyond what our current stack made of rain, rain lid, locker can. <clears throat> Among all these systems uh, that we tested, Kubernetes was the one with the most capabilities. Um, it's built in this kind of layered uh, way where there's a robust uh, um, ecosystem around it, uh, and a lot of components have been built around it. Uh, which has extended its extensibility, uh, which I'm sure you guys are already aware about, aware of. And because of its extensibility, we felt that it was the scheduler that we could integrate the best with LinkedIn's architecture. So we now had two paths to go forward to. Whether we could start kind of researching on our uh, pluggable scheduler um, architecture idea where we could decide how to uh, integrate Kubernetes with the rest of LinkedIn and complete that work, and versus whether we, we could also pick our first use case. There were a lot of teams looking to move into and use Kubernetes, and we wanted to, we had a need to support them. So we decided to do both, but first I'm gonna talk about our first use case. So our first use case was supporting Jupyter Notebooks on Kubernetes. And when we proposed this to LinkedIn security team, their question was, Kubernetes is not integrated with any security system that we have in LinkedIn. So is it going to bring down LinkedIn security? Or can it, can it be integrated? So we decided on our integration strategy with the kind of security first in mind. We deployed Kubernetes on Rain, so both the control plane and the, uh, the, applic the application plane, the kubelets, are all on Rain. So when they get deployed, um, they can get <clears throat> uh, a certificate from our own certificate server, um, and they, they also can send metrics to our own metric service. So this allows us to kind of discover and may manage Kubernetes cluster, just the way we, are, we have been managing and discovering rain. When we deployed Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes, so Jupyter Hub is 
mainly two pod, an orchestration pod, which is called the Jupyter Hub, and then uh, the actual worker or minion pod, which is the kind of the single person notebook, uh, which is like an AI engineer would use to do their work. So both of these types of pods could get certificates from our certificate server um, and could talk to the rest of LinkedIn using LinkedIn's own certificate authority. The user's workflow is like this. User um, logs in uh, to our ML platform UI, and then they get a two-factor authentication token uh, from our certificate server. And then that token is used by Jupyter Hub to figure out which user they have to spawn the notebook pod for. And then that notebook pod gets this token as a secret uh, <clears throat> mounted on it so that they can, they, it can use it for subsequent actions. Um, users' notebooks get loaded from a git back storage service that we have in LinkedIn. And so this allows the user to kind of do their work and save their work in that git back storage repository. And uh, when they come back to the notebook platform, they can start over from where, this, where they left off. Um, the other thing is, because that token is available to the notebook as a secret, that can be used to talk to our HDFS cluster securely. So when the user launches a query to our HDFS cluster, uh, we use a Spark context manager called Apache Levy. Um, and <clears throat> the Apache Levy uh, will use that token to validate, identify the user, and and talk on behalf of them to our secure HDFS cluster. Once we <clears throat> productionized Jupyter Hub, we thought that uh, Kubernetes' journey at LinkedIn would be very smooth. And this is usually what day one Kubernetes looks like. And then that brings to our first war story. One fine evening, our notebook pod started crashing. And we thought that the flannel D uh, overlay network that we were using, that's the one to blame. That was the root cause of the, that was the root cause. And when we looked up advice about this on the internet, the reigning advice was we should nuke our cluster and start over. Luckily, we didn't do that. Um, <clears throat> we kept digging into what could be the issue. Uh, our next root cause, um, Hypothesis was that it was the core DNS pod that we were running to su support all DNS of all pods. And when we uh, decoupled core DNS from the rest, from the Jupyter Hub and Notebook pods, the issue still didn't go away. So that hypothesis was not correct. A few days into the debugging of this issue, we, was, we started having internal arguments within the team that whether we should actually listen to the advice on the internet and kill our cluster and start over. Then we got our first clue. It was that all pod-to-pod -pod networking was not working. And this particular issue is not related to Jupyter Hub or notebooks, but it's, it's, a, it's a deeper issue. So we had to take a deep look at pod-to-pod -pod networking and really try to understand how that works. So this is how Jupyter Notebooks, uh, sorry, Kubernetes pod-to-pod -pod networking should work. All pods have their own IP address, and say when the Jupyter Hub pod wants to send an IP packet to the notebook, it just addresses that IP packet to that notebook's IP address, and it should go there. However, in reality, this packet has to go out of the host where Jupyter Notebook is, travel to all the routers and switches that are in the data center, and then go into the, pod, into the host where the Jupyter Notebook pod is. So for to do that, the IP address that's on that IP packet has to make sense to the routers and switches. And the internal IP address used in Kubernetes in the pods do not make sense to the routers and switches. So, <clears throat> the way it works is when a packet is sent from Jupyter Hub, that packet addressed to the notebook pod 
makes it to this flannel D daemon on the host. And what flannel D daemon does is it will wrap this packet with the IP address of the destination host, of the host where the notebook pod is. And now that now this IP packet can make it out of the host where the Jupyter Hub host is and go to the host where the notebook is. And so this packet, which is double wrapped, it now makes it into the host where the notebook is. And it goes to the Flannel D app, whose job is to unwrap this. And once it gets unwrapped, it now has the address of the notebook pod, so it makes it to the notebook. Unfortunately, there's more to this madness. In both cases, when the packet is going out of the host where the Jupyter Hub is, or going into the host where the notebook is, we're asking the hosts to act as routers. We're asking them, take this packet, IP packet, which is coming from an internal uh, network, and send it send to the external network. And in the case of the ingress, we're telling Take a packet from the external network and send it to the internal network. And Linux operating systems would not do that unless they are <clears throat> told, explicitly told, by setting a kernel flag. And that is the IPv4 forwarding flag. Once that's, we set this IPv4 forwarding flag, um, it starts working. So what happened, the root cause of this issue was uh, we have an underlying automation platform which sets up our hosts. And that automation platform had gone in and unset this flag, the IPv4 forwarding flag, in a bunch of our hosts. And that caused this problem. So once we fixed that issue in that underlying automation platform, no notebooks were happy and users were happy. So after, that, after this, we thought, OK, uh, we're done with war stories. Uh, Kubernetes is going to be successful at LinkedIn. This brings to our second war story. One fine evening, notebook pods stopped working. We thought that the flannel D daemon was to blame. And when we looked up advice on the internet, the reigning advice was nuke your cluster, start over. This time, <clears throat> we quickly identified that pod to pod networking was not the issue. We had to take a, a closer look and found out that our Jupyter Hub pod was complaining that uh, it, it cannot reach the API server. And that's why it started crashing and dominoing uh, a crash into the notebooks. So we take, took a look at how the Jupyter Hub pod is constructed. In our case, the, the, our Jupyter Hub pod has three containers. And in its container, that gets certificates from our certificate server. And then this in its container makes that certificate available for uh, the subsequent containers, which is we have an Nginx container to set up routes, and then um, a hub container to orchestrate pods. And <clears throat> in this particular case, it was the Nginx container complaining that it doesn't have this um, uh, Kubernetes service host environment variable set. Therefore, it doesn't know where the API server is. And because it doesn't know where the API server is, it doesn't work. It just crashes. So in our clusters, we set the Kubernetes service host environment variable on every pod using a pod preset. Um, a pod preset, um, if you guys know, it's something you can use to say that, OK, do this before the pod is set up. And in our case, we basically say, OK, set up the Kubernetes service host environment variable on the pod's environment before you start the pod. And it's always set to the FQDN of the API server. And that ensures that user can securely talk to the API server, because the FQDN is the only thing that's in the API server's certificate. So before Kubernetes version 1.14, init containers did not honor um, pod presets. So 
pot wizards could not be set on init container. So what we did was we hard coded the uh, Kubernetes service host value in the init container. So once we upgraded to 1.14, the <clears throat> init container's uh, issue was fixed at 1.14. We didn't know that. So pod preset controller tried to apply the Kubernetes service host value on the init container. And it found a con conflict. It found that there was a value with the same key, uh, but a different value for the Kubernetes service host. And once uh, it failed there, it failed to apply that environment variable value in any subsequent container. So once we fixed this issue, um, things started working again, and the notebook pod was happy. So after this, we extended our use case to a batch, a batch use case. Um, <clears throat> users wanted to be able to launch distributed TensorFlow training right from their notebooks. So we enabled that. Uh, we're using Kubeflow's pairing library. Users could annotate their notebooks, notebook code, and then once they ran that, it would actually talk to the TF operator on the cluster, and then the TF operator would launch a TensorFlow cluster with workers distributed across the cluster. And these workers would be able to talk to the uh, NVIDIA device plugins on those hosts to get GPUs allocated to them. So this enabled them to uh, do a very large distributed job and also take advantage of GPUs uh, while uh, talking to our security GPS cluster. Our next use case was another online uh, use case where um, serving, um, <clears throat> serving models directly from our Kubernetes cluster. So let's say there is a production service that uh, wants to identify the image of a cat. So it will send that image of a cat to this model service, and then that request would, uh, it, what it expects from the model service is the word cat. So that request gets forwarded to uh, the model serving, TF serving pod in our model serving cluster, and then the TF serving pod will route it to uh, a model uh, that's de de uh, deployed by our uh, mo model deployment uh, system. And this can also take advantage of GPUs on the box. So it can answer a lot of queries in parallel, um, it can take, it can cache uh, queries and things like that. With these three use cases, we had started um, supporting a model authoring uh, through Jupyter Notebooks, model training through TensorFlow Distributed Training, and model serving through TF Serving. And this were significant parts of an ML pipeline. So naturally, <clears throat> we now had an issue with figuring out, do we buy an entire pipeline from the open source, or do we build it in-house? So this is because LinkedIn already has a significant ML infrastructure that's built on uh, the Hadoop Yarn stack. And we had to kind of compare the strengths and weaknesses of the Hadoop Yarn stack versus the Kubernetes stack. The Hadoop Yarn stack is very well integrated into LinkedIn, and also um, it's has capabilities such as hierarchical queues, preemption, that we use a lot. Um, Kubernetes, on the other hand, is very strong with mature container support. Um, and it also, its API is implemented by all the new ML training uh, frameworks. So we had to bring this both of these worlds together because there are strengths on both sides and we, our next-gen ML pipeline, had to adapt the best. Um, <clears throat> so to bridge the gap, we started um, initiatives such as 
allowing users to be able to securely access HDFS directly from their Kubernetes cluster. So Kerberos is what's used in LinkedIn all across our HDFS clusters. Um, we are building a product that we may open source is to be able to uh, support Kerberos directly from the Kubernetes cluster. So the way it works is when user logs in uh, and submits a job to Kubernetes, um, they are able to submit a Kerberos ticket along with it. And that ticket uh, is handled by a delegation token controller um, and a delegation token service that we will build in the Kubernetes cluster. And <clears throat> this delegation token controller and service then talks to the HDFS cluster to get a Hadoop delegation token. And then it mounts that into the, uh, into the worker pods. This allows the pods to directly talk to HDFS, HDFS cluster um, uh, securely. And once that worker is done, that delegation to token could be revoked. Uh, if that worker's uh, uh, lifetime spans longer than the delegation token's expiry, then that gets automatically renewed by this delegation token service. All right, so after supporting both online and batch AI workloads on our Kubernetes platform, which we showed the value and the confidence to the team, um, we are working on extending Kubernetes and unifying the platform. So here are more integrations that we are working on. Um, Pass layer integration with Race and Orca. Um, we are also working on unified topology integration. The unified topology provides this single shared view of LinkedIn's application fleet and its topology, uh, basically what runs where. So we have many systems, internal systems, depends on such a view. Um, because, for example, that like certificate management server distribute the firewall system and DNS discovery. And we also work on our back integration with DataVault using automation web hooks, pod certificate integration using init containers, um, or the physical host. We also have implemented the CRI for our locker containers. The idea is Kubernetes would be able to speak with Locker CRI out of the box. So the init container in the Locker CRI would decrypt the secrets in the config and the open firewall port if necessary. As you can see with all these integrations, Kubernetes adoption at LinkedIn is really taking, taking off. So let's wrap up. Um, Kubernetes, the whole ecosystem is really powerful and growing very fast. Um, however, day two operation and integrations, especially with a huge legacy infrastructure, can be challenging. Supporting our ultimate goal is to create a unified compute platform on top of this Kubernetes. Um, what started with supporting emerging AI workloads to prove the value and show confidence was a great kickstart for us. Cloud native is more than cloud only. Kubernetes and its ecosystem embodies cloud-centric best practices and provide this cloud native approach to modernize our legacy infrastructure. It has a huge value for large scale enterprise companies. All right, that's for this talk. Thank you for coming. So.